Okay, so you're all experts on the back row about um, models of, uh, of selection. And uh, so this quotation from Chuck Mansky's report for the U.S. National Research Councils um, that, uh, you know, maybe what's going on in these articles we read about in the journals is that drug addicts or this also covers alcoholics as well, in, this is referring to, the people who go into treatment may be self-selected and what you're seeing is not the effect of the treatment but what you, it's the people themselves who would in any case most probably have done better and the, either the treatment effect is overestimated or there is no treatment effect and it's all selection bias. And uh, just another point, um, if we're talking about this, uh, this Mansky report is that um, he also, the, the members of this committee went to the journals that published these articles on treatment effects in, in drug addiction and, and alcoholism and so on and so forth and showed that there's also a selection mechanism there in what gets printed or what gets accepted in the journals. So anybody who writes a paper and says, hmm, treatment doesn't work, right, um, will uh, get his paper rejected more or less with probability one but um, the ones that get published are, have so called public interest in the sense that somebody actually found a positive treatment effect. No, okay? just because they couldn't find significant results or because of a bias in the editorial process? Bias in the know. editorial process, right. So. So that the, that's also in there. I should also put it up on the slide so that if you've got a paper, like my paper, which is going to say that treatment doesn't really work, then, um, but this paper is getting published. But the, the, uh, the you'll have a job. Okay. So yeah, a question. I mean, couldn't sample selection work the other way? Yes. Where yes. people who go for treatment are the ones who figure they can't do it themselves and need help? Right. We'll, talk, we'll go into that. Okay. We'll go into that. Right. This is where panel data is important. Mm -hmm. right? If we didn't have panel data, what you said would be, it could be that the, the hopeless cases are coming into treatment. They're about to see themselves dead, right? And, uh, and they, they go into treatment and uh, to save themselves from, from the end. Right? And, uh, but, but this is panel data. So we're not comparing the treated with other people we're comparing the treated with themselves before and after. So panel data has, here has an effect. So I need to go through the next slide because you all know it. The specialists, you know the treatment effects model is that uh, we have some outcome, we have some controls for individual I, T is the treatment status, it could be the case that treatment status is correlated with what you don't observe. They could be negatively selective, they could be positively selective. To assume that there's no selection bias at all would be um, obtuse. So um, um, one has to do something about it. Yet the uh, number of papers that get published like this um, in, in the sort of the mental health literature and so on and so forth, um, where there's no where, where it's simply assumed that the expected value of TU is zero, as if treatment is, is randomized, right? But that's not going to be um, the case. Now, counterfactuals, I don't have to explain that to you, people. We would really like, to, what is the counterfactual? Um, um, it, it's what would have happened to you, um, say you got treatment, if you hadn't got treatment. That's your counterfactual. And if you hadn't got treatment, your counterfactual would be, what would happen if you got treatment? Well, you're never going to see the counterfactual, right? And because you're never going to see the counterfactual, we're, 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 we're never going to get, we don't know whether this selection is positive or negative. Um, ideally, we'd like to see people in two different states, you know, and then we can be no doubt, right? I didn't get the treatment, I was in a mess. I get the treatment, I'm still in a mess. Be a really easy way to do it, the treatment didn't work for me. You, if, if you looked at US data, you could exploit state level variation in the propensity of judges to 
send people to forced treatment and then do propensity score no. matching on people well, on drug addicts that are sent to yeah. either jail or forced treatment using variation and how yeah. the yeah. different yeah. states are. Well, that, that issue has been looked into. Um, you're assuming that the judges are um, public choice guys should have uh, immediately jumped on this one, right? It could be that what the judges are doing <laughs> in selecting um, this ac accused to treatment, right, is that the judge may be thinking, well, he could be thinking, well, I think this guy, the treatment is going to help him. Yeah, that should be just a right, but the point is, the point is, the judge, the judges are also involved in it. The selection model for the judge's decision, and if you want to read an excellent book on all this, which is very accessible, right, which is not strictly about economics, but it's more about judges and criminology, is is Chuck Mansky's book from 1995 called Identification Problems in the Social Sciences, where he looks specifically at that issue. It's work with he did with Dan Nagin on. Um, on uh, punishments or what and so on. Yeah. Anyway, and the judges themselves are also want to look good sometimes, and they may be doing things for reasons that they want to show them they're liberal or not liberal, and all these things are, are addressed there. Judges are human beings as well. Now, um, I want to go through the main methodologies uh, very quickly here, because I think I can do in this room, um, for um, identifying treatment effects. Okay. Are you done here? Okay. So uh, we begin that self selectivity into treatment may induce bias. The propensity scoring model tries to take into account everything you observe, but there's something that you can't observe. And the, what you can't observe is susceptibility. And it turns out that what you can't observe is the dominant factor. You know, kind of, just to take a, a parallel from wage <coughs> equations, right? So wage equations, you can observe a lot about people, their age, their education, so on and so forth. Um, that's what you can observe. What is the R squared of a typical Minster equation? 0.3. That means 70% of the variance in wages is to do what you can't observe. And when it comes to consuming drugs, right, it turns out that personality and what you can't observe, they are really the driving forces. In fact, what you can observe is going to explain very little. So heterogeneity, we can suspect in the case of drug addiction, is going to be very, very large. And uh, therefore, this thing that you can't observe is the dominant factor and propensity scoring based on what you can observe is going to be like a little bit like Hamlet without the Prince okay it's not going to be the main thing it's always going to be the subsidiary thing what about randomized trials well I don't know in in in, in Israel it's illegal you cannot do randomized trials to find out answers whether treatment is going to help drug addicts or not. You can't deny somebody treatment to say, sorry, you're not in the sample for, to get this uh, trial. It's been through the courts. It's illegal. I understand so that... Is just standard drug testing that the pharmaceutical companies do is all illegal? I don't know about standard drug testing, but I... Uh, you, mean, you mean pharmaceutical drugs, yeah, right? Yeah, drugs. Yeah. right. But okay. it's, you can't do randomized trials. Um, I, may, I, th I understand the law is slightly different in um, the law is slightly different in the, in the United States, where I understand there there have been randomised trials, not in drug addiction, but in in the various labour market papers that you see where certain programmes have been have been have been randomised. Like a policy level in addiction, but a university researcher standing out standing outside of a place where drug users frequent, and then every third person is given a coupon for treatment. They can't do that? Oh, no, you can do that. But okay. to deny treatment to somebody or to force treatment on somebody, you say, right, oh, it's a random trial, right? You, come here. Here's the treatment. I don't want the treatment. But you're in the sample for the treated, <laughs> right? So there's obviously great moral problems with randomized trials. And in any case, um, I think in this kind of area, like in many other kind of areas, 
randomized trials induce what psychologists call Hawthorne effects, right? So this is based on all these tests in the Hawthorne factory near Chicago in the 1930s, where the people in the experiment suddenly behaved differently because they were in the experiment. They became self-conscious, they weren't natural, and so on and so forth, right? So let's, for moral and other reasons, let's put um, randomized trials to one side. Now, Heckman's famous idea for parametric identification in 1976, basically his Nobel Prize was mainly uh, motivated by this. Heckman himself has abandoned this uh, way of thinking um, by parametrizing what you don't observe, like in our case it would be susceptibility to drugs, it would be um, the uh, 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 effects of treatment on the individual to say that's a bivariate normal distribution, right, and say, well, if it was a bivariate normal distribution, then that would give you a mixture model that would identify. But if it wasn't bivariate normal, if it was something else, we could turn the sign round, right? So I, I, th there's many instances of this where parametric identification um, is arbitrary. And if somebody pays me enough money, I will find the right parametric identification to get the result that, um, that he wants, right? So, and then um, certainly in labor economics, parametric identification is out, it's finished. Right? Um, there has to be some more persuasive identification. Um, so we're not going to use parametric identification. Now, what about quasi? Just, just for the record, I mean, that's a little strong statement. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's many, many papers that are currently being published that use the parametric techniques. Used. Now, if you want to say used. that people have a lot of skepticism about the yeah. results because of what you're saying, that's a very yeah. easy yeah. statement. No, it has to, has to be something more than just parametric identification. People use this Heckman method, but there's something else that they're doing, which is instrumental variables estimation. Because sometimes, in the... Sometimes in not. Okay. Let, let, let us slide. I'm just okay. saying this. Okay. Um, now, quasi-experiments, um, well, they... they, they, they a a, a quasi-experiment would happen when when there was, um, it's a bit difficult to think about it in, uh, in, in the case of uh, treat drug treatment, but I can think of a very good example in the case of something I was talking about in Otago, which is the, when we're looking at the effects of parents on children and we're worried about there's a genetic effect, so let's look at <coughs> siblings, uh, biological children versus adopted children, right? So. The adopted children don't have anything genetically in common with their parents, with the, their adopting parents, right? Um, and uh, well, um, it's difficult to think of situations like that in the case of drug addiction, but let's put that on one side, right? But natural experiments um, is, uh, is when um, we have something that influences the outcome, that influences the treatment. Um, which doesn't influence the outcome. Okay, so you were going down on Josh Angrist all day long about the Vietnam War experiment and so on, and as somebody who lived through it all, it's a load of nonsense, right? The idea was that there would be, you know, kind of in, in the Vietnam War, there was uh, they needed soldiers, the American Army needed soldiers, but they didn't need a full conscription. So they had to do a kind of raffle or a lottery, lottery is the word. You had to do a lottery and uh, you were lucky you came out with a low number but otherwise were le less lucky so they took higher education to defer the draft and, uh, um, and they did it not because so much of higher education but because, bec because of they wanted to avoid going off to Vietnam and getting killed, right? So um, the um, so this lottery was like a randomizer. Um, and um, of course, uh, classical econometricians will recognize this as an instrumental variables estimator, right? But it's always important in any research to choose a sexy name for what you're doing. So natural experiments became, I'm a natural experimenter, right? So I'm working on one right now in, in, in with this data that I'm going to describe, right? Which is uh, 
looking at kind of exogenous factors, or what I think might be exogenous factors, that influence the decision to go into treatment, where we think those exogenous factors have no effect on the outcome. So that would give you a kind of an IV estimator. But today, I do not have this. So today, I'm going to talk about what is like a basket case in evaluation. A basket case in evaluation is when you've got no quasi-experiments, you've got no natural experimentation, you've got nothing. Right? So you could say, well, you've got nothing, forget about it. Right? And the answer is, yeah, but you can still say something. Right? And this is the concept of partial identification. Oh, if we had panel data, proper panel data, we, right. Now, I do have panel data here, but I use it in a specific way. But uh, partial identification is, um, is really Mansky's idea. And he's written this book called Partial Identification. That's the title of the book, right? So you want to, Mansky 2003. And uh, in a way, what I'm doing here is combining partial identification with panel data, which is differences and differences. So differences and differences is I compare drug addicts before and after the treatment, and I compare them with other drug addicts who didn't get the treatment before and after. Okay, so it's uh, a differences and difference thing, but, I, but we still have the issue of who were the guys, who were the addicts that went into treatment. And I have no instrumental variables for that, right? So the question is, what can be said? So what's going to be turn out to be the case? TE is the treatment effect, OK? So I can't really say what the treat, I can't really say what the treatment effect is. Right, so if you want me to say, can I show that the, the treatments for these drug addicts works, help them get off drugs, I can't show that. Right, but I can say what the TE is not. <laughs> okay, let me say that. Okay, I can say what's not, I can't say what is. Right, so I can't establish here um, the, the treatment effect is favorable. <coughs> but I think I can establish that the treatment effect is not favorable. That doesn't mean to say the treatment effect is harmful, right? So I can say something that's not. Now, policy makers, you may say, well, that doesn't interest them. What they want to know is the full truth, right? What is the treatment effect? Right? But it's also, so you say, well, I, I can't deliver that because I, I simply cannot do it methodologically. But maybe I can show you that the treatment isn't working. And they will say, right, that's also of interest, isn't it? The treatment effect is not, not working. So we're paying all this money on these on these uh, on these treatments, but it doesn't seem to be working. Yes. I just have a question about on the, on the positive side. Let's say you have a, a program, people self-select into it, and it has a success rate of forty-five percent in of these treated people. <coughs> it's true that you can't infer that from the population of drug addicts that the success rate of that treatment would be forty-five percent, but that still shows that it's it's greater than zero, right? Even if there's a bias, it still shows that it's effective with some people. Right. Okay. So, I'm just wondering if it's an overstatement to say that we get nothing from it. You, you can't get what the percentage right. is, but you, don't you at least know that it's not zero? Let okay. me answer that question with these slides, okay? Because okay? I'm changing the order of the, of the presentation. So, um, I have data on, or maybe I should back up a bit and say something very briefly about the data. In, in 19... 
87 a social security benefit is introduced for drug addicts in Israel. Um, and these are for drug addicts who are, who are really very hard cases, who are not working, and are destitute. Okay? But like any social security benefit, they have to... Which way am I going here? Like any social security benefit, they have to fill in a questionnaire. It's the National Insurance Institute, after all. You can't just dish out the money. And uh, they, have to, they have to prove that they're drug addicts who really need this. First of all, prove that they're drug addicts, right? Uh, you would be surprised that some people were applying who weren't drug addicts. And... Uh, they promised to become <coughs> drug addicts. Uh, or or became, became drug addicts just to get this, this benefit, right? But they had to establish that they had a history of drug addiction. Anyway, let's assume that this, um, uh, these uh, people administering the program who are paramedics and psychiatrists and all these kind of people know what they're doing, right? And, they, and when you come out with a certificate that you're a drug addict, you go to the Social National Insurance Institute and you start drawing benefit. And um, then every so often, and when you, when at this intake, there's, you give your history of drugs, or current drug use, all the usual things that are collected in, in these kind of... Uh, um, there's a form, right, which is um, filled in, and it's a face-to-face -face interview. It's, it's, uh, um, and uh, the questionnaire slightly changed. So if you see old and new, it's because there were slight changes in the questionnaire. You'll see that the data are categorical, there, um, and the cat number of categories of drug use, frequency of drug use, change between one um, questionnaire and the next, and then. Every two years or so, I say or so because not everybody stuck to this two years thing, you have to come back to renew your benefit. Now, to renew your benefit doesn't mean to say you have to prove you're a drug addict all over again. Right? Not then. Um, you ha it's an administrative thing. You have to come up and say, I'm still here, I'm still in the country, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm still needy, right? And, uh, and it's not as if if you turned up and say, right, I'm clean, I'm no longer on drugs, uh, they say, right, you don't need a benefit. If you turn up, it was almost, it's almost just an administrative thing to do. But they filled in another one of these questionnaires and with an update, right? So they, they, apart from their treatment histories that we knew at intake, we've got tr also treatment since intake. Yeah. Right. So we have um, we have panel data because they filled in some well more than one more than one follow up. Right. Some of them I've got people there with with five follow ups. Right. But I just take the first follow up. Right. The intake as against first follow up. And of course there are different times between 1987 and 1997. So we have a cohort effect. Right. So. One cohort, maybe, they did the intake in 1987, but another cohort is they did the intake in, in 1991, yes? It might well be an administrative thing, but would an addict have any reasonable apprehension that at some point benefits might be cut off to ones who are no longer addicts? Yes. Because then I, you I, just continue to lie and say, oh, yeah, well, yeah. Sure yeah, I've, uh, I, I've shown in, for the published article that the people who applied is there any connection with them getting their benefits discontinued and their drug consumption? The answer is no. It's, it's as they say, it, the issue is not, uh, it's not to sort not of... whether they get a cut off, it's whether they're worried that at some point they might get a cut off. We don't know. We don't know yeah, whether they're yeah, worried yeah. whether they will get a cut off, but I know... I'll keep lying to my parents mm. saying that yes, I believe in mm. semantics, I'm scared that the yeah. parents are going to... It could be going on. It could be going on, yes. No. Is it urine sample? Yes. Uh -huh. But, but, is, but is you're obviously not an expert in urine sampling taking because you can fool a urine sample, right? <laughs> this, is a urine, <laughs> this is a urine sample. This is a urine sample where it's done under supervision, right? Let's leave it at that, okay? Because it's very easy to fool um, urine samples. 
These are very shifty characters who can fool anybody. Is, is, um, I've actually is, been is, to these is, places is and seen it done. Is intake by hypodermic and uh, part, of, part of, the, of the base of drugs in Israel? Needles are not very popular in Israel, no. I have no idea what drugs no. are being abused. No. Okay. Well, we'll see a list of them in a minute. No, but see, but see uh, the, 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 uh, the jazz musicians in the 1950s and 60s had the, the legendary track marks on the floor. Yeah, so no, it's, it's not. Casual needles, needles, so needles is not a is, is not a big scene in Israel. Certainly not during this period. If you ask why 1997, you won't believe this. They stopped coding the data in 1997 <coughs> for lack of public interest. Okay, oh. so so I've only got this data till 1997. But what it does give me is 3,695 addicts, right, who were in intake and were observed at follow up. And I'm going to look at those between these two, two, two interviews. It's not the same two periods of time because we have different cohorts. And also, for some of them, the follow-up was after three years rather than two years. Not everybody walked in. These are drug addicts. They have an appointment to come at a certain time, but they don't always show up, right? But nobody cuts off their benefit and says, hey, you didn't show up time, right? It's not like that. It's a very liberal system. Um, I feel a little bit guilty because there's been some public comment on all this research in the press in Israel and some politicians have now honed in on this and, and said, what are we doing? You know, who, why these addicts should be forced into treatment and, or, or, we, or, or the benefits should be just cut off. Right? So this debate is, is going on right now. Now, let, let, me, let me come to the answer. Let me come to the answer of your, your question. Um, okay, Who was it? whose question was it? Right. And and right. Zero. Right. Now, um, to fix ideas, right? There's two groups of people. There's group A. They are the treated. And there's group B, they are the non-treated. Now, what, what the data observe, what the data reveal, is the expected value of the outcome, which is the use of drugs. For group A, given the fact that their treatment indicator is one. That's what the data reveal. The counterfactual for the <coughs> treated is what would have happened to the outcome variable had they not been treated. That we don't know. And the unconditional expectation of Y is simply, through Bayes' rule, is simply this plus this, where PA is the probability that group A would get treatment. And for the untreated, which is group B, we have what would happen to their outcome variable. Well, we observe this. We see what the outcome variable is, drug use, conditional on the fact that they didn't get treated. That's what the data reveal. But what the data are silent about is the counterfactual, <coughs> is what would have happened to the untreated had they got the treated, had been treated. Now, um, to cut and, and there's selectivity going on now in who's getting the treatment and who's not getting the treatment. Now suppose we weren't prepared to assume anything. What do these data reveal about the size of the treatment effect? Now you said something about 0.4 something or other? Apparently if it's successful at 40% and I was saying that you can establish if you can at least tell that it's helping somebody. No. The answer to that question is no. So let's see why. Okay? But instead of doing it theoretically through these Bayes rule, let's use some numbers empirically. Right? So maybe it's on the next slide, these numbers. Um, wait a minute. Um, I 
I can't believe it. Just a minute. Is this a different version to? Well, something has gone wrong here, but uh, maybe I can recreate it in this way. So let's go to, let's go back to uh, uh, the this formula here okay now Could you, before you do that can you just ask one question about who when you get these social security benefits are you required to get treatment no so treatment is purely unconditional to, the, to get these yeah. benefits it's just voluntary you, you can it, just ask them later on in the, in the follow up interview yeah you're oh, not way, have you had any treatment yes it is completely unconditional on treatment. That is now. The simple answer to Jeremy's question is that the people who got treatment, it's not because of treatment work, is that there are can do kind of people who really want to solve the problems. And so they chose to get treatment, but it, that just measures the fact that they really were serious about trying to solve the problem. You just identify those kind of people as opposed to. Um, well, le le let me give you the correct answer. I, I, are I have prepared a slide on this, but. Uh, You're, you're all wrong. <laughs> right. Now, let me give you a, a, numer a numerical example of this formula um, given the data. Right. So it's actually written down in the paper, but I had a slide, but it seems to have vanished. Now, it turns out that uh, from one of the questions was, um, do you think you're better off um, group A, which is the treated group? They were asked at the follow-up, do you think your situation has improved since last time, okay, since intake? And uh, the, um, and the answer to to that question was that something like in group A, I, I haven't got the exact numbers, okay, so you just have to bear with me because this, this slide seems to have vanished. It's something like 20% said we're better off in group A. And in group B, when asked the same question, um, something like 15% said they were better off. Right. So you say, okay, so the treated are, the treatment effect is plus 5%, right? And the standard deviations. Yeah, the same question? Yes. But, yeah, I didn't mean it literally. I meant the ones who are in group A might be thinking that they're better off because they sought treatment and they're now using a little bit less than they used to. The ones in group B never wanted treatment and now they're getting as many drugs as they had before and they're getting money, so maybe they're buying right. more drugs, so they're better off. No. I'm just using this as an illustration of this idea, okay? So let's assume that this is the relevant outcome that they're asking, right? The, the details of the question are, in terms of drug consumption, are you now consuming more or less than you did before, right? Right. And 20% basically are now saying, we're better off, we're consuming less. And on the untreated group, it's 15%. And it turns out, because the sample is so large, that these differences are statistically significant. So the temptation is to say, well, um, that the 
the treatment effect is favorable and it's 5%. Okay? When you read the paper, you may see the numbers are slightly different, but I can't just put them down um, now. So this number here is 0.2. Okay. Now, what would be the counterfactual for the treated if they hadn't got the treatment? Well, it's zero between zero and one. It could be that all of them say, oh, without the treatment, we would have all been better off, or none of them would have been. Okay? And since we can't say anything about the counterfactual, we must give these bounds. That the, this can be one or zero. Right? It may be that the treatment is really harming them. And that without the treatment, they would have all been better off. Or the opposite. Okay? And over here, the data reveal this. And this number is 0.15. What would have happened to the tr untreated had they got the treatment? Well, they could have all been better off. In which case, this thing will be 1. Or it could be zero. You know, the treatment wouldn't have helped them at all, or it would have completely helped them. And we don't know. Now, the proportion getting treatment in this data is 0.43 or something. Right? So PA is 0.43, and 1 minus PA is the complement of that. And we're assuming, uh, and PB. 1 minus PB is 1 minus 0.43. So we can now, we're now in a position to calculate the bounds of this treatment event. Right? We're now in a position to calculate TE, which is the expected value unconditionally of YA minus the expected value of YB. And the numbers are as follows. The upper bound is point. 571. So let's say there's 0.571. And the lower bound is 0.429. Minus 0.429. So there's minus 0.429. This is 1, and this is minus 1. Okay? So, what are the data revealing? When we don't have any control over who's going into treatment when there's all sorts of possible scenarios about selection. And now we can answer your question. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to get around to it, right? The data say that if you think that all the selection into treatment is um, bad and therefore had these people been treated it would have helped them that's like putting in ones over here for the counterfactuals, naught here and one here, then the treatment effect can't be higher than 0 0.571. Right? So if somebody wants to claim from this data that the treatment effect is 0 0.6, cannot possibly be. If somebody wants to claim from this data that the treatment effect is 0.571, basically what we, he would have to say to himself is that if all the people who treat, got treated didn't get it, didn't get the treatment, none of them would have improved. And if all the untreated, had they got the treatment, all of them would have improved. If you're prepared to buy that, the treatment effect would have been 0.571. But there's also the other extreme. And the other extreme gives you minus 0.429. And the gap between these two numbers, you will see, is exactly 1. Right? So in exams, when I give students this thing to make sure that they got the right answer. Just say, make sure the gap is one. Yes? Just to make sure I understand. So in terms of what we talked about in the morning, this would be a mixture model, but the probabilities are just constant, so, and they are driven by the data. So you don't have uh, an estimate.
estimation of PA and PA. These are sharp estimates, right? We just look at the data, right? These 3,000 and so individuals. It's not a two-stage procedure. It's not a two-stage procedure. This is just a calculation of what the unconditional probabilities would have been given the bounds on the counterfactual. The counterfactual is a, one counterfactual is nobody would have got help by these by this treatment and the other counterfactual is they all would have got helped by this treatment. So, had we got no data, with the absence of data, the bounds on the treatment effect is two, <coughs> right? Suppose there are people who think God has revealed to them the truth, right? So one group of people would say, yes, the treatment effect is one. Everybody who takes this treatment gets better. The other possibility is the treatment effect is minus one. Everybody who takes this treatment gets worse. You can't rule that out, right? You can't rule out that the treatment is bad for you and you're suffering from the treatment. So without data, the bounds on the treatment effect are two. What do the data do? They help you narrow the bounds to one. Okay, so we can say that the treatment effect cannot be higher than 0.571, but it can't be less than 0.429. Yes? But theoretically, PA could actually be predictive then, right? How do we find the predictive of PA? Which is yes. Think, think of some group like men, women, mm. uh, Arabs, Jews. This is all done for one group, okay? So those are the predictors or the controls, demographic controls, right? So and of course, I'm making this point because I'm using these, these numbers of, of, <coughs> of 0.2 and 0.15 are coming from the data for everybody. So I'm not taking account of those controls. Yes, Bob. I well, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm not getting this point, so I don't want to belabor it. I, can you, can, if you can sh quickly answer this question, great. If not, you can go off and I'll put you later. I don't see how this addresses the sample selection issue. Yeah. At the end of the day, how do I separate the treatment from the fact that these are people who really want to sell their own? Sample selection, imagine ourselves in an ideal situation, right, where we have two groups. We have the treated and the untreated. The treated is group A and the untreated is group B. Now, we would, the true treatment effect is the unconditional difference between these two numbers, right? Why unconditional? Because really what's going on in the data, group A are making a decision to get treatment or not treatment. Group B is making a decision to get treatment or not treatment. We want to simulate what would happen had they <coughs> not been making those selection decisions. So this is just Bayes' rule, right? So the unconditional difference between YA and YB is what would happen in a world without selection. We're not but we don't know that. bounds on what we can say given the selection problem. No, it's saying, the bound, given the selection problem, the bounds are that the treatment effect can't be higher than 0.571, and it can't be more negative than 0.429. So we still can't say if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we and can say that it's a really, really good thing or right, a really, really bad thing. Right, and therefore what's coming out of this is the fundamental issue, which is not just applies to treatment effects, but applies to all the social sciences or wherever you have non-experimental data where the treated haven't been randomized. The fundamental issue is that somebody can always say the treatment effect is positive, and there's always going to be somebody else who will use exactly the same data and say the treatment effect is negative. And the only kind of situation where we can rule out negative treatment effects is when the upper bound is one. Because the difference between them is one, so if the upper bound is one, we can say unambiguously that the treatment effect is favorable, but it's never going to work out that way. Okay, so there's always going to be ambiguity, and this is the reason why with non-experimental data, you're always going to get differences of opinion, and the differences of opinion are not coming from the data. The differences of opinion are coming from what people are assuming. Right? So doctors sometimes, ha they don't, not quite aware of it, but they, 
they call it the placebo effect, right? They would say, well, this can't do you any harm, right? It can't be harmful. <laughs> well, that's an assumption. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's an assumption. Economists assume rational selection. Right. Who's going to get treatment? People who think it's going to help them. Um, the judges before, right? Who are they going to give the treatment to? Well, the judges want to get promoted like everybody else. And what looks good will get the treatment, right? And everything, will, assumptions, 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 OK? But the data are fundamentally ambiguous on treatment effects. We can rule out, we can say what's not, right? So this is not. And this is not. We can rule that out. We can say what's not. We can't say what is. And that's what I meant before. With this data, with this method, yes. With, with this data and no method. There's no method here. It's just thinking coherently about expectations. I'm just looking, at, we're just looking at the data. And these are the non-parametric bounds on the treatment effect. Yes. No, this is for sub. With, you can do this for all your subgroups. For men, women, Arabs, Jews, young, old, right? You're still going to get a bounce. And because the difference between the upper one and the lower one is always one, then there's always going to be ambiguity. Doesn't matter who you're looking at. Okay. So here's what is called this is an example of partial identification, right? It's saying what is not. It's also it's saying what is. It's saying the treatment effect is somewhere between minus 0.429 and plus 0.571. Right? Now, for public policy discussions, that is not helpful. Right? Because it's like, make up your mind. Is the treatment effect positive or negative? Is well, that, I can't tell you. It suggests that you should be going to other data sets and then getting results there that you might be able to apply to the experience. So I still don't know why... This is a, nothing to do with the data sets. This will be true universally. This fundamental problem... Universally when you can't correct for selection, but I think there are panel methods that you could use exploiting state level variation in the right. US where there are mandates on judges right. that vary at the state level. Like, sure, all the judges are going to be optimizing their own thing, but they're going to have different kinds of constraints imposed on them by the legislators. Could you hold that slide there? Yeah. Can I ask a question about this? Yes. <coughs> the, uh, the language that you're, I mean, uh, that you're using is uh, the group A is a, uh, some sort of cohort, and they're making a decision about whether they have treatment or not. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And so. Well, they've made up their mind not to have, they've made up their mind, group A, to have treatment. Have treatment. Okay, so with, the, with, your, um, with your, your conditional expectation, of the outcome variable y sub a. Let's say it's binary, we have improved or have improved, okay? Um, that's, that's given this choice of treatment. Yes. Okay, and then on the other side, on the right-hand side, you're trying to think, out, now what would have happened to these guys if they had, uh, hadn't selected for treatment and done something else? Yeah. Right? So there's a, okay, what I'm having difficulty on is P sub a. P sub a, okay. P sub a. Well. Because you get, well, just tell me what P sub P, a. P is the probability of, of getting the treatment, which in this data is 0.4, in this sample, so this actually sample is the population, uh, is, is 0.47 something. Right? What's, your, what's, what's the reference group for that proportion? I mean, group A is the people who have selected mm. for treatment, mm. right? Or, or they, we're saying that they come from a certain demographic age kind of group and time cohort, yeah. and group yeah. B is another time cohort? You can drop the subscripts A and A here, and B here for the probabilities, yeah. because in the data, it's simply the proportions getting the treatment and the proportions not getting the treatment in the data. Right. And, the da and that's revealed. The data reveal that. The only thing that the data don't reveal is the counterfactual. Yeah, the proportions of one. Okay, and the, and, and the counterfactuals so at best bad. is one, at worst zero. Okay. So. So if we're not prepared to assume anything about these counterfactuals, then we get these bounds. 
And these bounds reveal the fundamental problem, it's not just in this data, but any data, that the treatment effect can be positive or negative. And even though it looks as though the treatment effect is positive in the data, that's only, that, that would be the case how, what would happen if these individuals had no choice over their treatment status. Suppose PA was one. There was. That's right, group A, you're going to get the treatment. With what probability? One. Because you're, I'm going to force this treatment on you. Then one minus PA is zero, so this disappears. Suppose for group B, they're like rats in an experiment. Group B, PB is zero. There's no way in which the B rats are going to get the treatment. So the treatment effect gives you EY, gives you EYA given that T is 1, minus EYB given that T is 0. So in a randomized trial where there's complete enforcement or compliance, then comparing what the data reveal would be okay. And then the treatment effect would be 0.2 minus 0.15, which is 0.05. <coughs> but the selection going on, so the bounds of the treatment effect are this. Okay. Now, well, that could be the end of the paper, but it's not. Because um, um, I want to ask myself, what assumptions do I have to make to be able to say something about the sign? <coughs> right? So I can say it's somewhere between here and here. Of course, zero is a number between there and there. There can be no effect at all. And can I say something about what's going on inside this bound? And the answer is, unless I'm prepared to make some untestable assumption, then no, we have to stop here. But I am going to make it an untestable assumption. I'm going to assume that um, the uh, drug addicts do a cost-benefit analysis and they're rational. Okay? And they will go into treatment if they think they're going to benefit from it. And well, we're beginning to run out of time, but it doesn't matter. Um, there is a rational treatment model here where um, we, we have um, some outcome in, in the intake interview, time zero is the intake interview, where Y is drug consumption, and there are covariates now in the model, Arabs, Jews, young, old, cohorts, and so on. And uh, Y11 is the drug consumption um, of addict J if he takes the treatment at the time of follow-up. Okay, it's obviously subsequent. And um, so there's some alpha here is like some affinity to drugs that the researcher doesn't observe. Okay, so we have people who are more susceptible to drugs and less susceptible to drugs. And uh, theta here is the treatment effect for individual J, for addict J. Notice here that I'm assuming heterogeneity in treatment effects. The treatment effect may be positive for some and negative for others or whatever, right? Or, or zero. And the epsilons are measurement error. Okay? And if he doesn't take the treatment, then the outcome will be this. And uh, Bob asked me before, well, why change the betas here, right? So think of this is J, XJ is Jew, right? So the treatment effect is really beta 1, 1 minus beta 1, 0 for Jews and theta J, right? So the treatment effect could be different for Jews and Arabs. And so um, this is the reason why we have a different parameter here and a different parameter here. It allows for treatment effects to vary by 
different groups in the population, as well as different individuals in that group. Okay, so among the group of Arabs, there's different Arabs, and the treatment effect for them could be different. And the treatment effect is random, so for, uh, for individual J, the average treatment effect is theta, and there's some random treatment effect. Okay. And they do this cost-benefit analysis and the benefit is the reduction in drug consumption but there's a cost to attending treatment not a money cost but a some kind cold turkey or there's some cost to attending treatment and they do this cost benefit analysis they're rational and they do this cost benefit analysis and they will take the treatment if bj is positive the benefit is positive they'll take the treatment this is rational selection a la Heckman. Okay, it's the same rational selection model. So this is the assumption I'm making. And I make this assumption, and to cut a, a story short, we get a difference in difference estimator where the change in drug consumption between the intake and the, and the, um, the uh, follow-up depends on the treatment status and uh, it depends on an interaction, depends on the covariates, X, Arabs, Jews, could be these betas have changed, depends on the interaction with treatment. And of course, there's something you don't observe, which is the random error. But notice this random error is made up of delta alpha, which is the change in the susceptibility to using drugs, which is something we don't observe, and it depends on the change in the measurement error, and it also depends on treatment status and, and the effect of uh, treatment um, on, of individual J. And there's correlation between, negative correlation between U and treatment status. Okay? So the people who are more in this rational treatment model, the people who are more likely to go into treatment are the people who are more likely to benefit from it. Okay? So there's going to be a selection bias problem. Here we want theta to be negative because we want treatment to reduce drug consumption. The output is the, the y variable is how much drugs are you using? They wanted to reduce it. And, but because of this correlation in between T and V and U, um, we're going to get a negative bias. Right? So it could look, if we didn't think about it, then we return to where we were at the beginning, that we're going to get um, a negative effect of the treated, of treatment, with this rational model, because the people who are going into treatment think it's doing them some good. Does it matter that you seem to be assuming costless treatment? No. There's a cost to the treatment. This cost is not just a money cost, it's a psychological cost. So it's, there's, there's some kind, but we don't observe this in the data. So CJ, CJ, which is the, the, the cost of the treatment over here, CJ is a random variable. OK? And I'll just talk about the correlations between what you don't observe. Yes, Bob? Yeah, so I think there's a pretty minor point, but I, I know it was bugging me about the way you did your betas there. And I think your explanation is you really have an interaction effect between yeah. treatment and X. Yeah. But the way you're modeling this, then you have your theta, which has this nu as your error term. It's interacting with T, but it should also interact with T times X. So the way you've yeah. done it, you disguise that. Yes. So, it, it, which is, uh, which is well, now you, your error term yeah. actually has X in yes. it. There's going to be there's going to be correlation between T and U, and there's going to be correlation between T X and U. And those betas. Yeah. In the mo in the empirical got model. Got a, got yeah. Error term in it. yeah. In the empirical model, this interaction term goes nowhere, right? So let's just assume this term is let's assume that beta one one is the same as beta zero. So this term drops out. It's about beta one zero and beta right. one. So the reason they're different is yeah. because you have an error term built into those. The the difference between this this is the this is the uh, this is the effect of being Jew or Arab um, for the treated versus the untreated. So B one zero is untreated, B one one is treated, and that treatment effect that new that little error term also interacts with those X's. 
I agree. I agree. That's, that if you agree, I agree. that's the specified what you have in here. The, the, there is, these right hand side variables it, are correlated with you. Way, but you now have an X in your error term. Right. There is no X in the error term. The error term is this. There's no X in the error term. No. I agree. No. There's no X in the, there is no X in the error term. I think there is. No. We, we anyway, we'll, we'll have to argue about that. There is no X in the error term. The, the only thing that comes into the error term are the things that you don't observe, which is you don't observe the worst alpha is like the, 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 the draw to drugs, right? How drugs are attractive to you. So we don't observe that. We don't observe measurement error, right? But we might exist. But then we've got the effect of you call it mu, I thought it was V. Anyway, never mind. It's the, it's the unobserved effect of treatment on drug consumption. We don't observe that out either. They're all in the error term, and this is going to give us correlation certainly between TJ and UJ, but also we've got TJ over here. Okay. So um, the, when we bring this to data, um, what the, the basic idea is going to be as follows. Suppose we estimate theta hat. Right, and we have no instruments here to identify. So the partial identification strategy is going to be this. If we estimate theta hat, if we estimate theta hat, and it turns out we're going to get the, the true estimate of theta plus the bias. But we know the bias under rational selection is going to be negative. So if theta hat is negative, it doesn't prove that treatment is making any difference. Why, is, why do we know the bias is, I mean, we can tell the bias both stories, right? That no, no. From the, from the rational selection model um, over here, we've come to the conclusion that the bias has to be negative because... But you select it if you think the treatment will help you. You might select to not take treatment because you know they will let you put it on your own. Under this rational model, if you think treatment will be helping you because BJ is positive, you will take the treatment. Yeah, and if you know that you can quit even without taking treatment, you don't take treatment if there's some cost of taking treatment. Right, so the benefit has to be... Ex the, the gross benefit has to exceed the cost. So, substituting in from the selection decision, we find that the expected value of TU is negative, right? So, the treated are more likely to have benefited in any case without the treatment, okay? Now, suppose that we've estimated theta hat to be negative with no instruments then always somebody could turn out and say it's, a, it's just selection bias that you've estimated. Okay? So it doesn't prove anything. Suppose that theta hat turns out to be zero. Somebody will say, well, wait a minute, how can it be zero? Because if there was no effect, selection bias would have made it negative. So if it's zero, it cannot be the case that the treatment effect is in this region. It cannot be the case that the treatment effect is positive. If theta hat is positive, despite the selection effect, should have made it negative, then it could be the case that the treatment effect is down here. Okay? So I can't establish that the treatment effect is in this region. But if I'm prepared to assume rationality, I can rule out that it's in this region. And that's what I do. So, I, as I said, the data are categorical. And therefore, I use an ordered logit framework, right? Because they're, they're categorical, and there are nine categories of... Well, the number of categories is one to five, so the change can be uh, nine, okay? And then I just, and there's various covariates 
here that we have to allow for. Um, you know, kind of uh, demographics is uh, Jews and Arabs and various different origins. We have Ashkenazim and Sephardim in Israel and, and so on and so forth. We have uh, different uh, groups. Okay? I, we also have covariates here for maturing out. So age, you know, there's this idea that people mature out of drugs. And it depends either on their age or on their duration of use. There's cohort effects going on here because it's not just one cohort. There's people who did this intake at different times. And there's also a follow the delay in the follow-up. You know, it's two years, but some did it after two years and some did it after three years. So we'd expect the time to make some effect. And there's also state dependence. It's somebody who is consuming maximum hard drugs in the previous period at follow-up can't consume more than maximum hard drugs. Right? And somebody who's in some minimal position, which is obviously not going to happen in this data, can't consume less than the minimum. So we should control for the initial level of drug use. <coughs> and then the paper finishes off with a load of regressions um, with the two questionnaires, the old questionnaire and the new questionnaire. And you can, well, you can't see, but the, there's a whole bunch of controls here for frequent for state dependence at frequency at intake, which are clearly significant, uh, not surprising. So people at the extremes are more likely to come back to the middle. So if you know what, there's, there's mean reversion and regression towards the mean in, in drug use, right? So the people who are s uh, h the hardest cases don't necessarily remain the hardest cases. So there's mobility. There's a load of time variables here to do with this maturing out, which I don't think any of them turned out to be statistically significant. This is a coefficient, this is a standard error. And then there's a whole lot of treatments here, right? Um, this is treatment post intake. We've got treatments at intake, treatments post intake. There were also some people who did more than one treatment. So we've got all these treatment indicators, and I test to see whether, whether they're jointly significant and doing something to reduce drug consumption. And the answer is no. The answer is no. <coughs> OK? So it's like saying, theta hat is zero. It's not negative. If it was, posi if it, if it was negative, right, then somebody would say, oh, it's just selection bias. So I, I do a few of these things, a few of these tests for the old questionnaire, the new questionnaire, which are basically different cohorts because the old questionnaire was obviously at the beginning of the data and this is towards the end of the data. And basically I now can rub out this section. Right? So I've narrowed, I've made an assumption which is rationality, and I can narrow down the treatment effect. Right? So it's not positive. It could be negative, I don't know. Right? But for public policy, I think the issue is that it's not positive. Well, if it was harmful, <laughs> it would also be important for public policy. But in other words, it's informative, it's partial identification, and uh, I say, well, we're all spoiled in econometrics and economics, we always, always want to know the whole truth. Well, this is not revealing the whole truth, it's revealing part of the truth. And half a loaf is better than no bread. And uh, the, uh, so my conclusion from, from this is that this partial identification strategy is giving you the result that these drug addicts, which are admittedly very hard cases, a lot of drug addicts who are working and who are leading some kind of normal life, but these drug addicts are not. So treatment doesn't seem to be working for them. Doesn't mean to say treatment won't work for other kinds of drug addicts, but these, these are really like at the bottom of the heap. And for them, treatment doesn't seem to be working. Yes. Okay. And I'm just sorry for asking these questions here, but so 
the end of the day, you get observations on somebody before, it, you know, with a before time period and an after time period. And two groups of people, untreated and treated. Now, uh, let's say for the untreated, they have 15% report that they're better off. Okay? And let's say for the treated, 15% report that they're better off. So, on the face of it, zero effect, zero difference between the two. Yeah. They still don't understand how the people who got treatment, maybe had they not gotten treatment, these guys recognize they can't solve the problem themselves. And so, so in fact, the treatment really did help them because if they didn't get the treatment, right, then um, they maybe would have been worse off down the road. Th can no. You, you just tell me in just in words why right. that can't be true. It can't be true, fellas. Suppose the treated compare their situation at time one under two different situations. One if they get treatment and one if not. That is what they're comparing. They're not comparing with the initial level of drug consumption. If they, suppose there was no cost to treatment. Those who thought that drug consumption at time one after treatment was less than drug consumption without treatment would take the treatment. So the only thing you have to compare is uh, is at time one, which is the time of follow-up, right? The treated will be those who thought that drug consumption would be lower, not relative to what it was at the beginning, but relative to what it would have been without the treatment at time one. And those who didn't take the treatment didn't take the treatment because at time one they thought that taking the treatment at time wouldn't have lowered their drug consumption at time one. So the comparison is not with what happened at time one versus time zero, but it's happening at time one against these counterfactuals. I don't know what these counterfactuals are, right? But I assume rationality, right? Now, why do I assume rationality? Because I'm an economist. Where we assume rationality. Right, I assume rationality. So if we assume rationality, we can rule out this region. And that region is an important region because it's the positive region. And it's, set, it's looking as though for these addicts, treatment is not benefiting them. I can't say whether it's really harming them, but half a loaf is better than no bread. Is it just report, self-reporting that they've been in treatment, or is there some actual evidence? Well, the, it's, it's, it's self-reporting. Okay, I'm not worried as much about sample No, it's self-reporting. I'm worried about people lying because they think at some point their benefit may come. It, they might be enti probably entirely wrong with their benefit to be cut off. But I'm thinking about the guy who's thinking, some t someday Parliament is going to get pissed off about this, and they're going to say that the folks who haven't been getting treatment, goals cut off. So I'm just going to say that I've been in treatment, even if I'm not, and then that will attenuate your measure of the effect of treatment, right? I don't know what was going on in their heads, right? When they, f they these are self-reports. Um, the you'd, you'd expect it to be biased in favor of reporting that you had had treatment when you hadn't, if you're worried about the thing being cut off. Okay, maybe you're embarrassed that you went to treatment and it didn't work for you, so you don't want to report that you went. But I think that'd be pretty trivial compared to the ones that are worried about the benefits being cut off at some point. The ones that didn't get treatment. I mean, here's a benefit that's not conditional on treatment. Every, it's declared it's not conditional that's on treatment. Declared, but you can't but then, the then what goes on in people's heads like that? I don't know. As long as there is one Bible reader left on earth, there will be a bias in public policy towards those who claim they've gone through treatment. That is the, the residual Calvinism in our, all our souls. There is a reward, no matter what the law says, there is a reward to going through treatment or to pretending to go through treatment. And they, yes. the addicts know that. Yeah. Okay. Addicts know that. So, so lying is rewarded. There's an incentive compatibility. So, so there's a measurement, there's a measurement error which will bias downwards the effect of I could introduce the measurement error in this treatment and say that somehow this measurement error is correlated. You tell me what you want it to be correlated with, and I can introduce it. But you can say it's like 
the measurement people are going to misreport treatment and the people who are more likely to misreport treatment are who? The te question is, is this misreporting of treatment? Now, if I think of treatment status of individual I is equal to true treatment status plus some measurement okay. error. Put, put in right? Previously I want you to tell me if, if VI, which is the measurement error in treatment status, is correlated with something to do with the outcome, I agree there's a problem. But I do not see that. People, if everybody has an incentive to lie about their treatment, it's not going to make any difference to what I'm saying here. It's just going to increase variance in the data. But what to make your criticism bite, you have to say that this measurement error in treatment is correlated with the delta no, alpha. No, which no, you just don't just measurement error. Measurement yeah. error is going to bias your thing down to zero. Yeah. Oh, so, well, so you're going to get attrition. You get. Um, it's not random measurement error. This you get some that really sucks to be good. It had a good effect on some of the slide. Yeah. Random measurement yeah. error is going to cause attenuation. Right. Right. Attenuation bias. I, I accept that. It's going to. There's two issues here. It, it could cause, yeah. it, will, it will certainly cause attenuation bias, That's what I was worried about. right? And it also could be correlated with something, right? So with I agree. If there's measurement error in treatment status, there will be attenuation bias, right? So. And it's correlation between the measurement error and demographic, uh, the demographic control variable. Here's, here's, the, twist, the, here's the twist in this. If the, if the measurement is always positive, if, if new is always positive, there are even the problem. Yeah. But uh, if it's always positive, people don't yeah. heal. You don't, you can misreport treatment two ways, right? You can say, I was treated, but I, I misreport that I uh, say I really wasn't. That's or you can yeah. say, I wasn't treated, and in fact, um, I, I say I was treated, I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. In that case, the, the standard attenuation bias doesn't work and actually is a, a different kind of bias. Look, if, if there's no variance, if there's no variance in V, in the measurement error, then it makes no difference. No, 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 but if, if, there's, if there's variance in the measurement error, then there'll be attenuation bias. If V is always one-sided, as opposed to your standard random normal. OK, so it could be one. I'm thinking it'd be one-sided. No, no, yeah. The, the lying is one-sided. But I think yeah. it would be no, Everybody who gets treatment the tells, tells the truth about the guy. They're going to treatment. But some people who didn't go to treatment. Oh, well. We're having all sorts of different views here about how people lie, right? Mm -hmm. Some people all, this, they, they always. I use introspection. How would I lie? <laughs> yeah, but how would I lie? I, I, maybe I would say I, I haven't been in treatment. I don't know. Anyway, this is what <coughs> my, my objective was to introduce the idea of partial identification, right? And to, to say, and this is an illustration of partial identification. And partial identification is for situations where you've got no instruments or no basis for point estimation of something. But you could still say something. And this is the something that I've said. Yes? Okay, we have time for one last question. We can stop. Uh, thank you. Um, just a question about earlier in your talk, before you add the assumption of rationality, you, you talked about before, if, if, if you, you just have your data, you can get those bounds. Yeah. And I just wanted to check about one thing in particular. This might not apply for drug types of drug addiction, but maybe the most serious kinds of might. What if you had a, a situation where it, it was pretty commonly recognized that without treatment, nobody would get better? So in other words, your counterfactual was something that actually there was pretty broad agreement towards. Namely, if you don't go through treatment, you're definitely not going to get better. What I'm wondering is, would that also be a way that you could rule out the negative balance? Yeah. Because then yeah. you get 20%, even with self-selection, if 20% of people are helped, then even without sample selection, it means that at least a non-zero positive yeah. percentage of people are helping yeah. treatment. What, what you've just said, in terms of this formula, is that let's take the people who didn't get the treatment. <coughs> right? We don't know this value here. right? But you might say that <coughs> if the... To say that all of them would have... Now let me go here. We know this number here, right? What would have happened to these people had they not got the treatment? 
right? Now, one possibility is that they all would have been better off. That really the treatment has, is, is harmful to them. Now, you would say, no, I'm not prepared to assume that. It's unreasonable to assume that. They can be no worse off without the treatment. That's what you're saying. Yeah, something like, you know, something like that. Terminal lung cancer where you all know what's going to happen if you don't get treatment. And, and it's not quite like drug addiction, but just in a case like that, I'm just wondering if you can still yeah. offer something. You can say, well, but we'll never know. You know, kind of, they the, the operate on the, the terminal lung cancer patient, and he, instead of dying six months' time from lung cancer, he dies on the operating table. And the doctor say, well, you know, we did our best, right? But the... You, you don't know, you really don't know what would have happened if this guy didn't have the operation, right? So in terms of this formula, you could say that without the treatment, group A could not have been better off. That is almost like assuming the conclusion of the evaluation before you began. And I, and I think, and that is going on all the time in medical trials, right? By placebo effects is exactly that. Saying, here's some here's some dummy, right? And uh, well, it can't make any difference to this guy. How do you know it can't make any difference to this guy? Well, there's no medical reason. Okay, but there may be a psychological reason, right? This guy is taking something, he gets all hyped up, and uh, he dies of a heart attack, right? How can you rule that out? You can't rule that out. You want to rule it out? That's no longer scientific, right? We're going after this to uh, yes, Popper's house. So that's yeah, but but it's very opposite because Karl Popper is famous here for writing the um, Open Societies and any and his en and its enemies, right? But I'm talking about Karl Popper of conjectures and refutations, and here by uh, what are you, you you hypothesize and you try and refute to assume the kind of things that you're saying, that it, it can't be harmful, it can't be worse, or something can't help. That is metaphysics already in the terms of Karl Popper. You know, that's like saying, I'm I, I know God has revealed it to me in some way, what the answer to this question is. Right. So I, but I'm assuming rationality here, which I feel in good company among economists when I was a, a group, before another group on a Thursday afternoon, you know, they said, what, drug addicts are rational? Yeah, Becker Murphy. Done. Right, so you say Becker and Murphy, right? And they say, Becker and who? Yeah. Murphy and who? Okay, thank you very much.